Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Sherlock Holmes. Got any comments? Email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. Um, Again, the votes are much appreciated. We've had some really high standings, particularly for a show that's less than four months old, uh, please go and cast your vote, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net, and remember our listener survey, survey survey.greatdetectives.net. What made uh, this particular uh, incarnation of Sherlock Holmes, the Rathbone Bruce episodes, work was, uh, to me, I think, is the chemistry between Rathbone and Bruce. Um, And... uh, uh, because they were real-life friends. And one of the interesting tidbits I found over at BasilRathbone.net was a little bit of an excerpt from Nigel Bruce's autobiography. Um, and he actually got a um, he got a telegram from Rathbone um, right before, uh, right after he'd had a failure of a play, The Night of Song. Uh, the telegram was from Basil Rathbone, who said, Do come back to Hollywood, Willie dear boy, and play Dr. Watson to my Sherlock Holmes. We'll have great fun together. Basil can never realize how much that telegram cheered me up, as when I received it, I was in the mood to put my head in a gas oven. Our Sherlock Holmes pictures took between 18 and 22 days to make. Often we shot out of continuity. The moment one sequence was ended, the... Scenery would be torn down in the next same stages for a completely new setup. We learned our entire parts before the picture commenced, as one does for a stage play. That meant we had no worries if the shooting schedule were changed and if the story was told out of its continuity. Roy Neal was always open to suggestions from Basil or myself, and we always accompanied him to daily rushes in the projection room. Uh, Roy, uh, Basil, uh, myself, and our Sherlock Holmes cast work together as a happy and contented team. Uh, and of the radio program, he writes, uh, We all got on like a house uh, on fire. Not only is Basil Rathbone a very dear friend, but he's one of the most unselfish and generous actors with whom it has ever been my pleasure to act. We had a great time together on the program and spent many hours playing golf at Riviera or Bel Air. Basil and I were evenly matched, both of us having handicaps of ten. In December of 1944, we took our radio program to Santa Barbara, where we raised $190,000 for the war bond drive. From there, we traveled to San Francisco for the sixth war loan drive. We spoke at numerous bond rallies, signed autographs, and sold bonds in two of the city's largest shops, met with the popular Mayor Lapham of San Francisco, and with him visited the police headquarters, where we, t- where we sold a bond to the chief of police, Charles DeLea. Here we also were also shown many interesting relics of crime, and Basil caused a lot of laughter when he told the chief that he was sorry to hear that they still had so, some unsolved crimes in San Francisco, as he and I solved every case we handled with the greatest of ease once every week on Friday nights, and each case took us half an hour. Uh, and he writes about um, Holmes, uh, about Rathbone going back to the theater, um, and uh, he said, basically, he, he, uh, he decided to go to the stage, which he always preferred, and on which he could play parts of his own choosing. My association with Basil had been a very long one. We had acted together in 14 Sherlock Holmes pictures in the film of Frenchman's Creek and on the radio in countless programs since October 2nd, 1939. Ours had been a very pleasant association and one which has brought me much publicity and a lot of money. During our time together, Basil and I never had it a row or any unpleasantness of any sort. I never worked with a nicer man than Basil, and I never acted with a more unselfish or more cooperative actor. So really great. Uh, I think that explains what makes the show work so well and the source of the great chemistry between these two guys. 
Um, we'll get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes, The Superfluous Pearl, in just a moment. But uh, I do want to remind you, as you make your plans uh, for the new year, and uh, you're looking at starting a new business, uh, you're, you're going to want to start a very nice personal website, well, just remember um, our host, the world's number one host, one and one Go to hosting.greatdetectives.net and find great deals on hosting and support the great detectives of old-time radio. Well, we're going to get into today's episode, uh, Superfluous Pearl. Now, I'm going to make some apology uh, up front, because I... Uh, on the Dragnet show, uh, cut commercials. Well, I did not cut or edit this episode. The way it's played is basically the way I found it. Um, and I think this was probably a home recording. And whoever recorded it, uh, they just recorded the plot. Um, so we've got no introduction, we've got no um, outro, and we've got no commercials. Uh, but, but the plot is pretty much, uh, intact. Uh, the beginning's a little abrupt, uh, because there's no opening. Uh, but just bear with it. Uh, there's, uh, there's none of the plot, uh, as far as I can tell from here that's missing. So let's go ahead and get into today's episode, The Superfluous Pearl. Town was full of bevies of fresh young beauties, brought up from the country to be presented at court. The papers were full of accounts of dinners, forays, garden parties and all the rest of what now seems like a forgotten life. Naturally, all this meant very little to home. Consequently, I was more than a bit surprised on returning one afternoon to our Baker Street lodgings to find him deep in a veritable snow drift of illustrated society magazines and papers. Watson. What do you know about this man, Damery? 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 What Damery? Lord Damery, of course. He took his photograph and all this is found in these days. Oh, that's true. The fellow's a household word in society. Mm, yes. He's a man of the world of a natural turn to diplomacy and he's asked me for a fourth day appointment to touch Lunchy. You mean that the uh, old dame is coming here? It's 4.30 now. And look at the mess oh, of the place he is. Oh, come on, you're so far. 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 You're so that will be the gentleman now, unless I'm very much mistaken. Punctual to the minute. Take a look out of the window, will you, Watson? That's a good fellow. Oh, really, very um, why you always expect me to play Sister Anne for you? Oh, all right, very well. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Holmes. He's up in the door to him. I just he's out in the front step making his kiss. Oh, my kiss down there. He's removing his hat and by. His lordship must have got a very expensive tailor. Every detail... And his black satin cravat, the straightened out of his shoes, is perfect. The shape must have cost him a good penny. Really, an unmarried man, our Lord Damery. Well, why do you say that, Holmes? Well, only a bachelor squanders money on his wardrobe with such a lavish hand. The married man is too busy putting his wife's bills for feathers and Oh, furlough. but it's worth it, my dear fellow. It's worth it, the pleasure of seeing the lady of one's choice in a fetching new bonnet. Or an agitating chip in my You can a rhapsody, my dear Watson. Our visitor huh? is just outside the door. Well, of course, it's really Come in. Ah, oh, Lord Damery, I presume. And this must be the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> He's delighted to make your acquaintance. Won't you sit down, sir? Watson dumped that encyclopedia off the other arm chair, will you? Ah, uh, yes, mm-hmm. I, I was hoping to find Dr. Watson. A pleasure, I assure you. Well, the pleasure is mine, sir. Yes, I'm truly delighted to find Dr. Watson present. This collaboration may be very necessary, Mr. Holmes. We are dealing on this occasion with one of the most ruthless individuals in all England. Oh, and who might that be? My sister, the Lady Alicia, <laughs> widow of the late Earl of Devon. <laughs> you don't say Yes, she has the well-known whim of iron. Anyone who crosses her in any way is in grave danger. You mean that she'd go as far as to poison them or, or knife them, is that? Ladies in high society, my dear Dr. Watson, have more subtle but nonetheless deadly ways of dealing with their adversaries. Yes, and for yes. whom is uh, the Lady Alicia sharpening her knife this time? Well, I suspect it's Miss Kitty Kissam. Kitty Kissam? You mean the delightful Kitty Kissam, the star of the... Sweet heart of the regiment? The same. And how did Lady Alicia Clark happen to cross the uh, charming kitty? Through my dunce of a nephew, Percy, who also happens to be Alicia's only son. Oh, he's become uh, infatuated with this kitty? He's asked her to marry him. And uh, quite, uh, well, quite naturally, his, his mother objects. No, that's the most startling aspect of the whole affair. As soon as I heard of the engagement, I rushed round, expecting to find Alicia in the midst of hysterics or 
At least having taken to her bed surrounded with smelling salts. And uh, such was not the case. No, on the contrary. She was sitting at her desk in the morning room, making out her list for a reception and music hour to be given tomorrow afternoon to honor Miss Kissam. Lord and Lady Coverdale, the Duke of Rockington, Lady Windermere. Well, I must say, my dear Alicia, I hardly expect to find you in such a cheerful mood. Why not? After all, what this family needs is new blood. They tell me dear that his father was a butcher and her mother a barmaid. Yes, I'm sure Percy should be very, very happy with the dear little thing. She's bound to make a big impression on all our friends. Alicia, I don't like the way you say that. You have a, a, a certain glint in your eyes. What glint, dear? The glimpse you had the evening you met the lady of Stacey at the top of the grand staircase at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> yes, we've been quarreling all the winter. It's such fun. Yes, you smiled politely and left her sweet color. Then you deliberately stepped on her chain, ripping it off at the waist, revealing the fact that she wore certain uh, red flannel undergarments. <laughs> Dear, you Stacey, she's the laughing stuff of Mayfair. I warn you, Alicia, Kitty Kisson is no lady of Stacey. Of course not, darling. She's no lady at all. That's what makes me so anxious to have our friends meet her. Sounds like a rather ominous situation, Lord Damery. By the way, do I gather that you have the pleasure of this person's acquaintance? Uh, well, that is, uh, yes, in a way. We, we've partaken of a bottle and a bird several times, don't you know, after the theater. It is really a dear little thing, in, in spite of her reputation. Reputation? Well, surely you've heard of her confounded pearls. I'm afraid I'm rather ignorant of the uh, chit-chat of our metropolis. But everyone knows that she was given those dashed pearls by a certain Balkan king who spends most of his time in Paris. She wears them constantly. For luncheon, for tea, for dinner, in and out of the theater. <laughs> I believe she even wears them in her bath. Mm. It's ostentatious. And what, um, they're a sort of trademark. Yes, I suppose you might call it that. It's the only evidence of bad taste I've ever known Kitty to indulge in. Bad taste? Well, confound it, man. You don't expect a woman to go flaunting her. Well, her past about as if she were proud of it. Not even if it uh, packs the theatre? Oh, blast those clothes. I suspect that whatever my sister has up her sleeve concerns them. How? Oh. Well, for one thing, she insists I hire a private detective to keep an eye on them. Says she doesn't want to run the risk of having them stolen in her house. Very solicitors of her. Hey, Watson? Why not solve the whole situation by suggesting to Miss Kitty that she leave her jewels at home? Black five. And, uh, well, there are times when Kitty Kissam can be as difficult as my sister. She oh. absolutely refuses. She says she would as soon appear in public without her petticoats as without her clothes. I've warned her that my sister Alicia means business. But she says no grand dame is going to get the better of her. Oh, an interesting situation, eh, Watson? It reminds me of well, society's leading oh. hostesses in conflict with um, one of the theater's most popular leading ladies. Well, I've been trying to bet on Miss Kitty. <laughs> you don't know my sister, Alicia. What makes you so positive that your sister is still opposed to the match between your nephew and Miss Kitty? Because in the first place, Percy can't afford to marry an actress. He has no money and is quite incapable of earning a living. My sister had a match practically arranged between him and Lord Beaverbottom's oldest daughter. He's the millionaire, though. And in the second place, Kitty must be a good ten years older than the boy. Well, she doesn't look like it. No, she's an actress. In it. short, you, um, you don't approve of the match, but uh, you'd hate to see her sister put one over on Miss Kitty Christmas. Yes, that's the situation in the nutshell. Now, I, I beg of you, Mr. Holmes, come and keep an eye on things. Ostensibly, you'll be there to guard these silly pills, but in reality, I want you to, well, prevent any unpleasantness that might harm Miss Kissam's professional popularity. After all, she's a bad fine actress, you know. Yes, yes, and an equally delightful supper partner, eh? Uh, awkward happens to Kitty, uh, Miss Kissam, at this party of yours, I shall cut Percy out of my will. He won't get a penny from me. And then where would you be? <laughs> my dear James, calm yourself. Anyone might think that it was you who'd become engaged to Miss Kissam instead of Percy. Besides, if Percy has to wait till you pop off, my dear, before he inherits the family wealth, I'll be dead and gone. You're too disgustingly young and healthy. Uh, it's no good trying to butter me up, Alicia. And I wish to remind you that it's not the family wealth Percy will inherit. It's my money, my own. I made it myself, and I shall leave it to whom I please. Of course you will, James. But we Damerys are famous for sticking together, aren't we, Pete? Oh, look. Who is the lean, rapacious, and uh, very distinguished man who just entered? 
Oh, uh, these are the gentlemen I've asked to guard Miss Kissam's pearls. Uh, and I warn you, Alicia, Sherlock Holmes has the best brain in England, so no monkey tricks. Don't be vulgar, James, my pet. Ah, oh, they see you. Coming over. And all of a flutter. Ah, oh, Mr. Holmes, it's so good of you to be so prompt. The guest of honor is you at any moment. Good evening, good evening. Lord Emerson. Uh, James, my darling, haven't you forgotten something? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Alicia, my dear... May I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend and colleague, Dr. Watson? How do you, How do? you do, madam? This is really delightful. I was just saying to Lord Damery, Mr. Holmes, that I had no idea a member of the police force could look so perfectly fascinating. I'm sorry to disappoint you, ma'am, but uh, we are not members of the official police. We are merely amateurs of the not-so-gentle art of detection. How charming. How simply charming. Did he kiss him? Oh, oh, oh. oh, here's my guest of honor now. Oh, judging by the rush in her direction... It seems that quite a few of my male guests have already had the privilege of meeting her. Yes, you see, um, they no longer lock actresses up in the wardrobe trunk after the performance, lady. Mm, yes, I see she's wearing her pearls. They certainly are magnificent. Almost as fine as mine, I should say. You don't suppose she insists on wearing them so consistently because her neck is too skinny? No one could ever suspect you were that man. <laughs> Touche, Alicia. He had you there. Don't be unpleasant, James. Come along, Mr. Holmes. You too, Doctor... Uh, Wilson? Uh, Watson? Oh, of course, to be sure. After all, if you're to stand guard over Miss Kissam's pearls, it's high time you made her acquaintance. Are you sure you wouldn't rather be kept an eye on yours? I imagine they must be quite as valuable. Yes, but how many pearls are handsome. It's a good thing James was never married, or his wife would be wearing them. Hmm. But I fancy they're in no danger. I'm not in the habit of having them stolen, which is more than can be said of actresses nowadays, judging by what I read in the papers. But come, I deal very remiss as a hostess. Not that my guests need to feel any need of me. Oh, how are you, Lady Coverdale? See what I mean, Mr. Holmes? Yes. The lady in this case certainly has a dagger up these three. Yes, and one in each garter as well. Come along and meet Kitty. Really? She's charming. I understand she gave me nothing but milk. Absolutely milk. Oh, there you are, my dear Kitty. Looking younger every day. That's because I'm happy. You must try it sometime. I want you to meet two friends that Lord Damery has invited. They're here to see that nobody steals your pearls. I'd die if anything should happen to them while you were at a party of mine. Oh, they've never been threatened before, Lady Elizabeth. Are your parties more dangerous than the others I go to? Oh, oh now, Kitty, easy does it. Uh, may I introduce my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, no, this is wonderful. I've read all of Dr. Watson's famous accounts of your wonderful adventures. Oh, thank you so much. Your sensationalism, my dear Miss Kissam. Oh, I don't believe it for a moment. Such wonderful, dramatic material. Have you ever thought of writing them into a play, Dr. Watson? Well, that's already been done most successfully with a great American actor, Mr. William Gillette who plays the leading role himself and does a far more creditable job of it, no doubt, than I could myself. Oh, I'll never believe that, Hart. Hmm, yes. Have you ever thought of playing the board, Mr. Holmes? There's a certain, uh, shall we say, voltage about you. You would make a very exciting performance. Ah, no, 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 don't you go try and persuade him to change his myth here, Miss Kitty. I'll never be able to follow him onto the stage. Well, my dear, this would never do. Hello, Pat. We can't allow these two people to monopolize you, Kitty, my sweet. You must meet some of our other friends. All in good time, Percy. First, give your fiancée a chance to catch her breath. Kitty, my dear, you must have a glass of champagne to brace you for the ordeal of meeting all these people. Percy, tell Paddleford to bring that tray over here. Oh, uh, very well, dear. I'm sure Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson could do with a spot. There's a bar in the ante room here if you'll just step in for a moment. Oh, James, my dear, aren't you forgetting what these gentlemen are here for? We can't leave Kitty unprotected. Ah, here's Paddleford. Allow me, Kitty, my dear. Oh, thank you, Lady Elizabeth. And a glass for you, Mr. Holmes, and one for... Oh! Oh, oh how clumsy of me. Get a towel, run, Percy. James, change your handkerchief. Oh, I soaked Miss Kitty's beautiful sleeves. Oh, dear. Uh, look out for the glasses. Get them swept up, Paddle, for quick. Well, that's easier, Miss Kitty. You're not hurt, are you, Kitty? They went right past your shoulder. Oh, no, I'm quite all right. Oh, but your sleeve, your beautiful sleeve, it's so... Oh, it doesn't matter, really. Here's the towel, my dear. Oh, just let me pack it. Dry. Good heavens. What is it? Your pearls. They're missing. Someone has stolen Miss Kitty's pearls. Oh, yeah. now, now control yourself, Alicia. They must have come loose in the excitement. No, they were stolen. I knew they would be. Yes, yes. I'm, I rather suspected the same thing myself, Lady Alicia. Of course, of course. They must be found. We must search everybody. Oh, now, please. Oh, this is awful. It's so embarrassing for everyone. Alicia, have you gone out of your mind? Uh, your sister's quite right, Lord Amory. We must search everybody. 
It's the only way to recover the pearls, and you and your nephew and the lady Alicia will be dispersed to the search. But that's preposterous. Yes, I know it is. But you can hardly expect your guests to submit to the indignity of a search if you don't um, set them an example. So shall we adjourn to the um, ante room, Lady Alicia? <laughs> Well, here we are, Mr. Holmes, my sister, my nephew, and myself. Which would you like to search first? I suppose we allow Miss Kitten to choose. After all, it's a she who lost the pearls. Oh, really, Mr. Holmes, I... Oh, that is, I feel it's all so unnecessary. The pearls came loose in the excitement over the upset tray that... Well, they probably rolled under a chair or rug somewhere. If we wait until the guests have gone, I'm sure we'll find them. Certainly not, my dear. Those pearls were stolen. There wasn't a chair or rug anywhere near us. Nothing but bare parquet floor and a lot of people. Yes, she's right about that, huh? Of course, I'm right. There's a thief in my house, and I insist that the fact that he or she is probably a guest of mine should be no protection. After all, that necklace was given you by a certain royal personage. It's practically a historical relic. Yes, I know, but really, I'd much rather not have any such a commotion. Nonsense, my dear. We must find the culprit. Everyone must be searched. Bravo, Lady Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. And now there's enough time for that, so that they will think that we've been thoroughly searched. Suppose we call in the rest of the guests, one at a time. You gentlemen can search the men, and uh, Kitty and I will search the ladies. Uh, behind that screen. Oh, please, I'd be much happy if you wouldn't. Nonsense. Let's get on with it. Right. But I still insist uh, the search begin with the camera. Oh, very well, if you insist on being a stickler for form. I suppose Percy and Lord Damery may as well turn out their pockets. Uh, no, Lady Alicia, we shall begin with you. Me? But I haven't any pockets. I don't even carry a reticule. So where could I hide anything? In your bodies. And Miss Kitten, if you will investigate Lady Alicia's body. The idea. The very idea. Oh, I'd, I'd much rather not. Very well. If you won't, Kitty, I will. Jane, don't you dare. Jane, take your hands off my neck. That's an outrage. Jane, stop. Stop it. I'm sorry, but I can't let this pass go on. I... That is... It's not worth it. That is, I... Well, you see, those pearls aren't real. My dear. You mean the king gave you imitation jewelry? Well, that whole story was made up by my publicity agent. He, well, he thought it would be good for me. I rather suspect you knew the pearls were imitation the first time you saw them. That's why you planned to show me up. But uh, all, all these stories about you and the king... Oh, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Percy, but... I'm really quite a respectable person. I've never met a king. Well, I, I must say this is a blow. Uh, a surprise, I mean. Uh, oh, I shall be terribly dragged by my pals, you know. They were all rather envious of me. Well, after all, no one needs to know. We don't have to publicize this thing to the world. Oh, but I must tell my guests, James, here. After all, I owe them some explanation if I let the whole matter drop after making such an issue of things. I'm sure that everyone will be interested to know that not only are Miss Kissam's pearls not real, but Miss Kissam is somewhat of an imposter herself. But how could you know that pearls were false mother dear? After all, ladies don't wear imitation jewels. And actresses don't wear trinkets given them by men who don't consider them ladies. Here is your engagement, I uh, Let me... Well, I didn't really... Oh, this is... Keep the ring as a remembrance, don't you know? Thank you, Percy, but I'd rather not. Well, Alessia, now that you've accomplished the result for which the party was undoubtedly given, suppose you let me send the guests home. Oh, not before I'd had a chance to explain. You'll do nothing of the kind. If Kitty Kissam wants people to think a king gave us some pearls, that's her business. Thank you, Lord Damien, but it really doesn't matter. I'd, well, I'd just as soon they did not. That story of the royal pearls was beginning to make me feel just a bit foolish. Oh, I'll admit it was helpful when I was just a struggling small pot player, but now, well, I flatter myself that my hold on the ladder of success is firm enough so that it'll take more than a few imitation pearls to shake me loose. Bravo, Miss Kitty. I salute your courage. Thank you, Miss Kitty. I see. Look here. Perhaps I've been a bit... Hasty, don't you know? You keep your silly mouth shut. I'll handle this from now on. You stay here, Alicia. I'm going to explain the situation to our guest. But, James... Alessia, shut up! Well, really? I'm afraid, Mr. Holmes, there's a freak of vulgarity in my brother. 
I'm sure I don't know where it comes from. Oh, probably from the same place he gets his honesty and sense of fair play. Dear me. Don't tell me you're going to be cross with me, too. By the way, whatever made you think that I might have secreted Miss Kitten's pearls in my body? My dear Lady Alicia, when something of value disappears during a manufacturer's promotion, the first one suspected should be the person who did the manufacturing. You mean uh, you thought that I upset the tray on purpose? Uh, quite. But come, let us um, join the others, shall we? I think she's given Lord Amory ample time to make his explanation. Miss Kitten... If you will do me the honor, Watson, uh, you may escort the lady Olivia. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, by the oh, oh, here's one. Oh, that makes 99. Uh, here's two more. 100 and 101. I found five more. All in a little bunch. Oh, this is simply thrilling. So much more fun than hunting for you say. Well, that makes 106. Jane, what on earth are you doing? Hunting for pearls. Seems I was right in the first place. And if Kitten's pearls weren't stolen, the string must have broken and strewn them all over the place. Any more? We've looked everywhere. I'm sure there isn't an inch we haven't searched. Then here you are, my dear Kitty. Allow me to return your pearls. Oh, thank you. But I don't understand. Uh, tell me, uh, Miss Kitson. Yes? How many pearls were there on your string? A hundred and five. But Holmes, the Lord Dame, has just counted them. He mentioned a hundred and six. There's one more pearl now than there was when it was stolen. It's incredible. It's absolutely impossible, my dear Watson. No, 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 no. It's not incredible. It's not even impossible. It's, uh... Really enlightening. Uh, what do you deduce from the presence of this added proof of the humble oyster, Lady Alicia? Perhaps you can explain uh, why there are now 106 pearls in Miss Gibson's necklace. Did you say 106? But my necklace, the, the Damery pearls have 106. Good heavens, my necklace, it's gone. Someone has taken my pearls. Then uh, may I ask, uh, Lady Alicia, what pearls are those still hidden in your body? Oh, but those are Miss Gibson's imitations. James must have taken mine off my neck when he was threatening to search me. And now he's pulled this trick to get even with me. The string that broke are my pearls. She has no right to them. They are the same any pearls. My dear Lady Alicia, there is one person who has a better right to them than yourself. That person, of course, would be Lord Damery's wife. Yes. Judging by the look in Lord Damery's eyes, Watson, wouldn't you say they, uh, they've been handed over to the proper party? My dear, yes. Elementary, my dear Holmes. Elementary. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, well, that was a uh, that was an interesting episode. I, I liked the the, tw- the twist towards the end. Holmes didn't get to do a whole lot of the of uh, Holmes of Holmes lock work. A little bit, but the deduction uh, wasn't as complicated. But they did an interesting job of building up this plot and the secondary characters. Uh, so, another good episode. We can put that in the books. Um, and uh, this one, of course, was one of those uh, very rare World War II uh, pre-1945 episodes of Holmes that's out there. So, I was glad we were able to share that with you. Um, and uh, we do have, before we go, one comment on Facebook correcting something that I got a little bit off uh, on last week's uh, or a couple weeks ago show. A uh, comment uh, from Jim Adam Edith uh, My- Miser wasn't the only writer of the Rathbone Bruce Sherlock Holmes episodes. All the episodes that I've heard that originally aired during the Petri Wine era were written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Well, that's definitely a, a fair point. I think that uh, there was a changeover, and I, I after I recorded the show, I. I checked the episode log. In the 45-46 uh, season, the entire thing was by Green and by Boucher. Um, so there was pr- probably a switchover. I don't know if it was at the beginning of the pre- Petri Wine era, uh, which started with the 43-44 uh, season, or if it was towards the uh, middle um, in the 44-45 season. But they did change. Um, they did change the writers. So good catch. All right, well, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, got any comments, send them to me, box13 at greatdetectors.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectors.net. And, hey, remember our Facebook page where we got that uh, comment from, facebook.greatdetectors.net. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.